Every now and then I'm scrolling Reddit and I come across something like this. Fat tax. Unsurprisingly, dictating plane tickets by body weight was more popular with passengers under 160 pounds. Well, no duh. But then I'm like, this is science? Isn't this more like market research than actual science? Here's something you can try. Go to r slash science and sort by psychology. What do you see? Psychos.org, Eric W. Dolan. Huh, why don't we keep scrolling? Here we got, hmm, Psychos.org, Eric W. Dolan. Okay, these are getting a lot of upvotes. What do we have here? Psychos.org, Maine? Who the hell is that? No, 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 no. Give me some more of that Eric W. Dolan. All these posts are pushed by two accounts. And this one, MVEA, has 30 million in post karma. Who is allowing this account to post so many articles from the same author? Well, surely the nice folks at SidePost.org only want us to read the most high quality research, right? Like this one. The name you're given at birth might subtly shape your appearance as you grow older. Somehow we have a biology flair and they're seriously trying to sell us that if society has certain expectations of how someone named John or Emma should appear, that over time that individual will unconsciously shape their physical appearance and expression to align with those expectations. They say a person might choose specific features according to these expectations, like their hairstyle, glasses, or makeup. Now, I've met Davids who are Arabs, Asians, Latinos, Whites, how in the fuck is there a common idea of what a David is supposed to look like? Beyond this, they claim that some parents will think of a specific name in advance for their baby and then change it at birth once they actually see the baby and feel that the name does not fit. They claim that this is modulated via the booba kiki effect, i.e. matching the word booba with rounder shapes which is a phenomenon I certainly subscribe to. They recruited these sad saps out of online university with a payment of $2.80 for their participation. And they gave them these quizzes where they'd have four options and just try to match the name to the face. I just don't see it. Like, I don't know if there's a book on it or something. Like, it's just known. Like, oh my God, if her name is Becky, she'll look like a total bitch. And participants matched adult targets with their true name in 30% of cases compared to 25% of just random chance? Is that really something to write home about? I mean, is that even replicable? And it's a long paper and you start reading it and they did a lot. They trained a machine learning algorithm on a large data set to try and match, again, images to names and they found that it performed 10% better than just random chance. And it's not in a made-up journal. I mean, the journal has an impact factor of 9.3, but it's just so much work for such an unworthy cause. Our next expert in facial research claims that men with dark triad traits, meaning Machiavellianism, psychopathy, and narcissism, are able to accurately detect similar traits in others' faces. They took 31 Japanese men and 28 Japanese women and they gave them a 12 item questionnaire that measured these three personality traits. And then they took the five faces that scored the highest and combined them into one composite face. So when you look at this figure, the two columns I've highlighted, these are some sick bastards, okay? If you see this face or this face, you are in trouble, run, because you are about to get fucked. Their results are unimpressive at best. They recruited 170 people and they had them look at these faces and judge each one of them on a rating scale how much they conformed to one of these dark personality traits. But if you look at table one, with the male faces, people scored slightly worse than zero, with zero being a random chance. And with the female faces, they scored slightly above zero. If you look at table two, they did Spearman's rank correlation coefficients to look at. Basically, if you were a sick fuck, did that mean you were better able to 
establish whether other people were sick fucks just based on their faces. But you can see on this table that pretty much everything was non-significant. I mean, except really for this row here, where for the men, there was an association where if you had dark personality traits, you had more accuracy in detecting Machiavellianism in the other men's faces. When you look at this correlation coefficient, it's not very strong. If you look at most ranges for this correlation coefficient, with zero being no relation, one being a strong positive correlation, this would be like a weak positive correlation. But it doesn't really matter because we already established that people weren't really able to tell the male dark personality traits based on the pictures anyway. That's what we established in table one. So the whole thing is a nothing burger. I think this commenter put it best. Methods dubious, sample minuscule, results questionable. Not to mention the whole concept reeks of phrenology. For those of you that don't know, phrenology was an old idea that a person's character, personality traits, and mental abilities could be determined by examining the shape, size, and details of their skull, and it was mainly purported by racists, so not a good thing to be associated with. But maybe r slash science is seeking to promote stereotypes? That really takes us to our next study. Studies show that men who are less dissatisfied with the size of their penises are more likely to own guns than other men. This is a sentence I never thought I would be reading in an abstract. We failed to observe any differences in personal gun ownership between men who have and have not attempted penis enlargement. From my understanding, the authors are believers in the psychosexual theory of gun ownership, meaning if you're only rocking a pistol, you're more likely to go out there and buy yourself a bazooka. But if you look at their graph, we see a clear negative relationship here. The more dissatisfied you are with your penis size, the less likely you are to purchase a firearm. And to their credit, they publish this anyway, despite it contradicting your theory. That is a showing of integrity and a real contribution to the world of science. Our next study on men's health claims that a female partner's orgasm can rescue masculinity lost to low testosterone. So in this one, they asked people online to read 12 vignettes, basically asked them to read some erotica, where a man and a woman have sex and there's different outcomes in which either the woman orgasms or not, the man either has low, normal, or high levels of natural testosterone, or the man is either taking or not taking supplemental testosterone. So for 12 unique vignettes total. People then, after reading the vignettes, filled out a 1 to 5 mean masculine rating scale where they rated masculinity from 1 to 5. This would be the rescue effect they're talking about. Only if you had low testosterone, female orgasm was able to bring you up from a 2.5 masculine rating to a 3.5. One wonders what can be accomplished as a human when you upgrade from 2.5 to 3.5 masculine rating scale. How can you assign a numeric rating scale to a subjective concept like masculinity, which has no universal definition? And then, how can you use that as a response outcome to an event that didn't actually happen, but that you just wrote about in a vignette? Not much to take away from that one. But next, in the subgenre of low quality sex research. Wives with long and high quality hair have more frequent sex, according to an online study from South Korea. They recruited 204 couples and asked them to fill out surveys where they rated hair quality on a scale from one to seven, whatever that means. Again, it's using a numeric scale for something subjective. And then if you look at figure one, it's a total mess. They have all these correlation coefficients listed here which are again, they're all weak positive correlation coefficients, which tell you nothing about causality. And yet, they're claiming that there is a causal pathway where wife's hair quality mediated through husband rated wife attractiveness and husband sex desire increases sexual frequency. You cannot make any inference on causality based on a one-time survey. 
and there's an, just an obvious confounding factors here were probably people that were just younger had probably higher hair quality ratings and would have higher sexual frequency just because they're younger. But again, I mean, they, they got a grant from this, they got published, people are just stealing grants left and right here. There's nothing to really take away from what they did, but hey, they got their name on something. You can also say it's problematic messaging implying that relationship quality, sexual frequency is based on something, you know, only on the woman's side being her hair quality. But overall, there's just so many of these posts that are like this, you know, like this one. New research on female video game characters and covers a twist. Female gamers prefer playing as highly sexualized characters despite disliking them. Or this one. This one claiming that Emoji use, while less frequent in older adults, can be used to help combat ageism and reduce loneliness. A lot of these studies involve using an online platform to recruit people to fill out a survey. And that's an inherently flawed study design. There's a sampling bias where people you choose are more likely to be younger and more online. There's a self-selection bias where people will choose to do your survey probably because they already have an interest or viewpoint about the topic. Or maybe, you know, they're just doing it for monetary incentive, so they don't care about what they pick and they'll just run through your questions as fast as possible. We see people using numeric scales for subjective things like emotions. And ultimately, there's so many confounding factors that you have to wonder how much do your associations that you find really even mean. So you're not really able to make claims from these experiments. Now, I'm not saying that these kinds of studies shouldn't be shared at all, but maybe r slash science is not the best place for that considering it's supposed to be community for scientific research. It's gonna sound like I'm hating on psychology and social sciences. I'm not, I think there's a lot of high quality work in these fields, it's just not pushed on r slash science a lot. I hate to say it, but they're feeding us slop here, and a lot of it will be featured on either the hot or top page on the subreddit. I've been inspired to make something that Eric Dolan would be proud of, something he would want to write about. So I'll be conducting a research study. How do our demographics affect our preference of tomato size for cooking and eating? Through deciphering how we choose our tomatoes, we can better understand how we choose each other. For our hypothesis, I theorize that Western societies will favor larger tomatoes, as these kinds of societies tend to favor larger caloric intake, bigger size proportion meals. I also think younger people will favor smaller tomatoes, as they often require less prep time to actually eat. Our population is going to be the people watching this video. For our data collection, we will be using a Google Forms survey linked in the description below. We will be using a combination of four option multiple choice, asking for preference between four different sizes of tomato. We will also be asking participants to rate on a scale of one to five their desirability for each size of tomato. This is after filling in their demographics. For data analysis, we'll be collecting descriptive statistics. We'll be using chi-square to compare our categorical variables and a NOVA or t-test for our continuous variables, such as age, along with a linear regression analysis looking at age and the average tomato preference score on the 1 to 5 rating scale. As the sole author, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. For anticipated biases, I suspect there will be a large proportion of sarcastic assholes in our sample size given that we are only recruiting from this YouTube video. Your contribution to the world of science would be incredibly meaningful. Please consider taking the time to fill out this Google Form survey so we can make it big on the SciPost.org and r slash science. I will also be giving out a $25 gift card to Amazon if we have at least 10 unique participants in this study. Thank you all for watching.